you, podcast listener. I am absolutely shattered. I've had an hour of argument with Michael about our website, and you will not believe how good it's going to turn out. He says it's going to be like... Anymore, do we, team? I don't know, but you, you <laughs> two don't off. Go on. <laughs> I've turned off. <laughs> Wake Rich, up, Richard. Richard's no, no, lost the will to live to again. A shake. <laughs> it's <laughs> podcast 129. You're with us on the wiggly sofa. Richard says there's a draft. A draft, not a giraffe. There is a, a draft. It's like being sat in an Alaskan ravine. <laughs> 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 but actually, we've lit the wood burner. Toast is in situ. Jam has been sent out of the room because she keeps sniffing and snivelling around Michael. So we've sent her out. But this week, we've got lots coming up on the podcast. We've got our latest iTunes review. We've got news about some finals of competitions that we're through to. Ricardo is going to check out my salad leaves. Mm. And we'll go and get the sprouter from the kitchen because I've planted up some sprouts. Really? And Farmer Phil's got hot news in from the farm. Brr, it's cold. <laughs> About his peas. Well, they're still in the shed. It's too cold. Oh. I mean, the draft down Rich's neck is down to the fact that here we are, the middle of April, and it feels like December. It is cold, isn't it? Mm. It's bitter. Out there today, you know, you can see, I was watching the kids walk to school this morning, and I guess you can see all their breath. It wasn't smoke. It wasn't cigarette smoke. <laughs> said to somebody yesterday that it seems that every year the magnolia bush comes into flower and then a whopping great frost comes and burns all its flowers off yeah. and that seems to happen every year right. so we must have this cold snap well do you know year. what this this week last year was the hottest week of the year really yeah yeah and what a contrast this is uh, ridiculously cold by comparison first of all let's have a monty cast Monty Cast, a weekly fact on farming. A hen lives an average of five to seven years, but can live up to 20 years. She'll lay eggs her entire life. Another Monty Cast next week. Now, I thought that it would be a good time to give my dear listener a bit of an update on what's happening behind the scenes at Wigglers. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about was the garden at Hay. Right. And the awards that we... <laughs> I think it might be a bit premature to talk about that. <laughs> oh. Have we not got the garden, Hay? Well, anymore? I'm still waiting for, uh, <laughs> waiting for the confirmation that we need to mobilise the troops. But uh... <laughs> So if you'd <laughs> like to email the, the idea, Hay the Festival... Uh, yeah. Well, but... in our minds, it's going to be amazing, isn't it? Yes, well, it's 15 years project. Isn't but the reality it? is, though, it's slightly different to any time we have these. We've had similar experiences before, haven't we? So, uh, but, you know, without wishing to jeopardise the whole proceedings, <laughs> I think we should say to nothing. nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> Dear listener, we may have got a garden at Hay Festival this year. It starts on the 22nd of May. If we're not there, it's because we haven't confirmed. <laughs> I would have thought that the normal procedures will apply and on about the 18th of May they'll give you confirmation that they want a garden in a week's time. Quite Here we are, it. our latest iTunes review. Compulsively whimsical, says Alistair Dixon. I listen to these podcasts on my way into work in the city on the train. I live in the countryside, have friends like Farmer Phil. It's funny that, isn't it? And these ramblings help me carry my chickens wildlife garden and home life all the way with me until I get into the office. A slice of the good life. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Isn't that lovely, Phil? Someone mm. not only thinks enough of the weekly podcast to comment on it, but they also think enough of you to admit that they've got friends that they consider to be yeah. similar to it, it is a feeling that you have to get used to. I've noticed with the Facebook group you have similar relationships that you know quite a lot about people and yet obviously you haven't met them. They know quite a lot about you. And you have these conversations and then you suddenly think, do I know them? Yeah. Don't I know them? 
Um, Rich, yeah. go and please and check out our salad leaves. Check out? Yeah. Uh, you know, I did. Because they're on my windowsill. I clucked these little guys when I came in and I'm glad to see they're still alive, Have you know, and, and in fact they're almost ready for repotting. I've been watering them. You have, you have. The, the compost is a little bit dry, I have to say, because it has oh. kind of shrunk back from the leaves on the potting trays. The yeah, there are trays, some but... plants in this house, Rich, where the compost has blown away, so it's probably... <laughs> <laughs> but these are, you know, these are ready for repotting, Hev, now. I think this could be a little gorringe task over the next few days to get those in their own little individual pots, but I imagine Hannah will probably be playing a significant part in the transfer of some of these little guys. Well, but they need to be put in pots now and put in the windowsill in your kitchen so that you can nurture them and pay more attention to their needs. So what size pot does... How big is that plant? And well, what, what you want to do with those, don't you? You want to keep them in the kitchen so as you can prune them as and when. Yeah. So with lettuces, I would say probably the best thing is to take those little guys out and put them in a pot that they're going to stay in, really, for the sake of ease, because I can't imagine you want to pot them on again. So put them in a pot that's probably between 60 and 100 mil square. Four Yogurt inch, pot. Four... No, Bigger. no, something larger than that. Yeah, something was something about twice the size of a, a yard. I, I pot. know I'm only a farmer, but a hundred mil square and most flower pots, in my experience, are round. This seems to be slightly confusing information. Are we talking a three to four inch flower pot? Yeah, terracotta pot. <laughs> yeah, I just think about things. That I've just planted loads of tomato plants in, but yeah, terracotta pot's quite nice because you've got a bunch of those in the garden, so you could bring those in. There's more subtly pleasing in the kitchen as well, isn't it? We got a bit of feedback back from our salad leaf podcast and it comes from jennifer longton so thank you jennifer and the thing was that we had 500 members join our facebook group the night before last and i thought really? it's time 500 people at the same during the same night no <laughs> <laughs> we got to a total of 500 okay. members and i thought that's a celebration isn't it yeah. so i put out a message saying the first 30 people who emailed me back, could choose from goat socks, our book, or taters. And so I got all these emails straight in. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. But Jennifer added to her entry, and she said, after listening to you planting your salad leaves, I rushed straight out and I did my own. Although I did the same last year, I made the mistake of not planting them on into individual containers. No wonder they were not everlasting. With regard to yoghurt, I've just bought an easy yo yoghurt maker and powder mixed with water and I put it in a large thermos flask. It's yummy and really easy and it's available from Lakeland or healthy food shops. But this is the bit I liked. She said, being a composter of the heap variety, I hadn't felt that the wormery was necessary for me, but having listened to Terry... Walton and Ra- Richard rabbiting on about Terry's giant and healthy veg. My order will be posted shortly. Yeah, well right done, Ricardo. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> after 17 years, you've sold something. <laughs> <laughs> 17 years, yeah, Christ, it feels like it. Uh, it? The, uh, <laughs> the, you know, Terry loves his worms. I defy anybody. Occasionally, people uh, uh, struggle. You know, they've got a, they've had a wormy for two years, and they say, you know, I still haven't got any compost off it. But by and large, you know, once people get their wormers set up, they love them, they adore them, and and especially if you've got green fingers, because it's given Terry a whole new lease of life. You know, and he's a he's an old boy now in his dotage, really looking for <laughs> look, <laughs> looking for uh, looking for new opportunities and new new things and new interests in gardening. So it was uh, it was a cracking opportunity for him to you know develop his his. his Skills. I listened to you and Terry, Tales from Terry's Allotment, this morning while yeah. I was on my bike. Did you? Thoroughly enjoyed it. Are you, t- are you telling the truth? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I listened to you on my bike. And I don't know if you know, but you've got two reviews of your own. No, because I haven't, uh, haven't... And here they are. Don't pay as much attention so as I should. I'm afraid, possibly. obviously, they're not as good as the Wiggly reviews. The average rate is three and a half. But... Oh, uh, dear. Huh. It says... A super wren says, I spent today in my garden alone, but in company with Terry. What a brilliant way to garden if you haven't got an allotment. And the other one says, why, why, why did they name it Stop Hammer Time? But I think that was just a moment in the beginning, wasn't it? It's now called Tales from Terry's Allotment. Yes. And my second mystery question is, I'll be offered you a drink uh-huh. and you had sugar in it. Right. And I've made you tea for the last hundred uh, yeah. years, uh, well, and you've never I had coffee. sugar in it. I said coffee. 
Uh, with Albie. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he's making Albie. coffee, so it's easy to have coffee. Occasionally, you know, when folks are just making like a, a group drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to dip the spoon in a, a jar of instant coffee. It's better than say, no, no, actually, I'll have tea, if that's all right. <laughs> Forever. So, yeah, coffee. Um, Farmer Phil, what's going on on the farm? Well, we're watching the weather be rather inclement. We're watching things not growing very much. And we're thinking, what does this mean in the great scheme of things, other than Richard getting a stiff neck because he's sat in the draught? And what it really means is that the cattle look likely to stay in for potentially longer than they might normally do because there isn't any grass for them to eat yet. Right. And we seem to be having great difficulties, well not great difficulties, but the grass seed crop is very slow away and the problem will be if it gets delayed too much, the day length will change before the crop has actually bolted in the yield, if you see what I mean. So yeah. it'll think, right, I've got to grow straw and get to the, the end of my life cycle, if you like, at harvest, but it'll have missed out the bits where oh, it's wait a in. minute. Do you mean you've got tall plants with nothing in them? Yeah, this holds true for the garden as well, that plants decide when to do things, not just because of temperature, but because of day length. So that when the temperature rises enough for it to grow, if the day length has moved on, that it will rush through the growth stages, which can usually compromise yield. And this is what potentially we're looking at with a sort of rather abnormal wet weather pattern. So should you plant later? Or should you just well, no, go you for you should it? just accept the fact that you're probably, you know, we can't do anything about the weather, we'll have what we're given. But it is interesting that we will see an effect because of this in three or four months' time. And I suspect the same is true in the garden, isn't it, Rich? That yeah, <clears throat> things are so much slower, certainly compared to last year. But I think I would prefer to have weather like this now. And wet springs are really good, certainly for garlic and stuff like that. You know, there's, you can imagine those cloves are going to be swelling up quite nicely. And I would rather have this now than something that we had, you know, similar to last year, where we had this beautiful April, and then it didn't stop raining from the middle of June to the end of July. So, you know, you kind of think that we're going to have a summer at the end of this possibly wet spring. And in many respects, it's better to have a season like like this so things are slow but they do catch up you know if you get stuff in the ground things catch up I mean it just means that you've got a, a, you know a later a slightly later planted season. I've noticed that um, particularly uh, I was out on the grass fields the last few days spreading fertilizer and I've noticed that we've got a lot of skylarks pairing up really? but I assume that if the weather's too harsh on them once they actually get as far as nesting that probably won't be very good for them so that it would want to give up in a minute won't it yeah skylarks have several clutches during the course of the year i mean they probably have four or five clutches i mean one of the most important things for them is a diversity of crop types Mm. so there's sufficient crop to support invertebrates which the chicks are rummaging around trying to catch well that of course is the benefit of the grass seed crop because it they just love that and it must be because it does support a range of insects and and whatever else for them to find forage for definitely i think well that's one thing i haven't heard much of this year because the weather's like you say been decidedly dodgy you know really now you kind of sit outside and you get a warm april day and you can hear the skylark because they pick up Mm. and hover in the sky and just throw their song out and that's something i haven't heard much of at all because it's just bogging isn't it the weather it really is we haven't heard the cuckoo yet either no i haven't heard the cuckoo And I haven't seen a swallow yet. I know there's a a around, because a mate of mine said he saw one a few days ago, so I know the swallows are probably down the south of the country. Mm. But um, no, haven't heard a cuckoo yet. Where do cuckoos come from? South Africa. So if you're in South Africa, dear listener... (laughs) You probably have heard a cuckoo. (laughs) Have you got one there? Is it cuckooing? (laughs) (laughs) They're probably in transit, aren't they? You know, they're, they're on their way over. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? But the season I mean, it adds to the variety and spice of life, doesn't it, you know? I mean, well, this is no, why English people talk about the weather no so much. No good complaining it's so about changeable. it, because you can't change it. No. Mm. Have you got your peas out yet? No. Well, that's the thing, is we're a little bit different. We grow vining peas for seed. That's right. And we have grown peas for seed, combining dry, for a long time. And we reckon that it's better to wait until the soil is warm and plant them quite late into perfect conditions so that they get up and grow like the clappers, that there's nothing a pea likes less than this sort of cold, wet conditions when it's, you know, an inch, a couple of inches tall. In the garden, obviously, you can protect them with a cloche or whatever, and it'll keep the worst of it off. But out in the field, it lays them wide open to all sorts of damping off diseases and and root problems, and it stops them growing, and it takes them an age to get going again. It's right. much better to leave them in the shed. Right, but, right. of course, it piles all our workload up in a heap Yeah, because yeah. we're not doing them, and in a minute we'll have to be 
doing cattle, getting cattle out, planting peas, this, that and the other, you name it, and I expect Heather will want a bag or two of birdseed in amongst it, and yeah. it'll all get a bit chaotic again. Yeah. How is the birdseed going? Are you behind, Phil? No, and I'm... And Cashy, are you I'm, behind? I'm, I'm yeah. very pleased to say... Yeah. Your <laughs> name has been mud in recent yeah. months, Phil. But Cashy... Oh. We, we have fully caught up with a, a slight uh, production hiccup, and we're now right where we should be, bang up to date. Shall we have a little moment in the garden at Le Manoir? Because as the dear listener will know, we had a little break as we put our catalogue to bed earlier in the year. And what we wanted to do to celebrate that catalogue going to bed was take our dear graphic designers out for a little spot of lunch somewhere really special. And so off we toddled to Le Manoir, so that's Raymond Blanc's joint, down in Oxford to have a spot of lunch. So should we just have a moment in the garden there to get the atmosphere? They didn't invite me. (laughs) Yeah, you missed a treat, Phil. It was bloody good. (laughs) It was good, I have to say. It was really special. Dear listener, you're following me and Ricardo down a wiggly pass. And we're at Raymond's. And I don't know if all you American, New Zealand, Chinese, New Zealand, American listeners know. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I said there's a person in France as well, isn't there? So you could add that to your, your French list of... Uh, <laughs> listeners know, but Raymond Blanc is... He's quite good at cooking. He's all right, isn't he? Yes, yeah. he, can, he can make an omelette. Definitely. So we're at Le Manoir in Oxford... Having saved up for 22 years, <laughs> three months and seven days. Did you enjoy your... We've talked, talked about coming down for a long time, haven't we, the podcast team. Unfortunately, Phil's missed, uh, missed this, but uh, we, we restructured it. We called it the, uh, the business development team. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell him, he so, might uh, listen. <laughs> <laughs> so, consequently, Phil's not part of that, so he couldn't come. No. But he's missed a treat. I mean, I, you know, I've got to say, Phil, that was, that was a delicious lunch. <laughs> well, uh, it was a shame you weren't there, but you know, I'm sure you could come back another day. So for listeners who haven't had the opportunity to travel into the deepest Oxfordshire, into Raymond's garden and see his rhubarb forces, <clears throat> what have they missed, Rich? They've Explain missed the experience. Well, missed a treat. well, isn't it lovely? I mean, we've got a beautiful day. There are, there are, you can hear the rooks croaking above us. I see they're all nesting now. I mean, it won't be long before there's some chicks in the nests up there. But it's a stunning garden. Obviously well manicured. A bit like the food. But we've just seen a mallard nesting in the daffodil bed. Michael and I over there when we were waiting for you guys to... to um, Powder our noses. yourselves up a little bit. Powder yeah, our right. noses. Yeah, powder noses. Uh, but we're, you're kind of wandering around and uh, lots of water and there's, there's, uh, there's, there's sort of connotations of Japanese water gardens really with a, a kind of English country garden bed. Yeah, but this is all very arty farty. But you know, for those farmers out there that are producing food, can you explain what we've just eaten in terms of quantity, in terms of quality, and in terms of experience? It's a holistic eating experience rather than just sitting down to it to a yeah. meal. You know, you come out and you you got you're in nice company and you enjoy the whole thing, right? Rather than um, just going out and stuffing your face with a uh, chicken tikka masala and a <laughs> so it's slightly different. Even though I quite like doing that occasionally. But, now uh, looking over to my right, Mary is gone with Sam. They <laughs> they made a sharp yeah, exit. Off. But there's a rather dapper fella in a three piece suit. I believe it's a. Savile Row effort. <laughs> <laughs> my, my tailor will thank you no end for those <laughs> kind words. Hannah. What did you think of today's food? Exquisite as always. And what makes it exquisite? Because when all said and done, the ingredients are the same as any other ingredients. Well, I don't think the then ingredient... you can get anywhere. No, I don't think they're quite the same. I think that the top few percent of the quality level of the ingredients in the market are scooped off before we get the chance to buy the rest. But do you they... mean that they've had the best compost or they've had the best gardener or they've <clears> had the <throat> best pig producer or they've been fed the best? What is it that makes it the best? Isn't it just because you've come out in your lovely suit, the surroundings are beautiful yes. and the people say, 
Hello, may I show you to, to, to your Six table? Six people to show you to your yeah. table, yes. And we are here in the, just overlooking the koi pond in the Japanese pavilion, with a little babbling waterfall in the background there. And Isn't it just you've paid your money? Well, I, I actually, Heather, you've paid the money, for which <laughs> we all thank you. Oh, totally <laughs> right. yeah. yes. This is a thank you for the catalogue, dear listener, in case you think we come weekly. We don't. <laughs> well, we could. No, we can't. <laughs> But what I mean is, Michael, isn't it just that you think it's great because you've paid, or well, I've paid, well, we, we, more we, money? We did have the experience of seeing San who hasn't been before, and her face lit up as that first mouthful of her starter risotto went in. Yeah. And she went into half-speed eating mode, which I think is a common occurrence in this restaurant, that the food is so exquisite yeah. that you'd savour every half mouthful. Yeah, I think you're right there. Because we're not actually... We haven't actually ate vast quantities of anything. Very little. But This was do... only lunch and we are coming again for dinner, aren't we? <laughs> um, but it's, it's not about the quantity, is it? It's, it's entirely about the quality. Yeah. Entirely about the quality. So we're at the veggie patch, which is where we belong. Empty. Yeah, there's just a line of rhubarb forces with a uh, San and Mary in attendance. Should we see what's under them? Yeah, let's, let's see. Who did, did you see that? Does that stuff remind you of anybody? Yeah. Check out the accidental ecomaniac. That's Miranda Newsome. www.theaccidentalecomaniac.com. She's got a wormery yeah. and she's got. The mail coming round. Good Lord. The newspaper, the mail. Uh, Rich, are you going to get this sprouter or not? OK, shall I go and get the sprouter now? <laughs> Make it snappy, Rich. Up and down. Don't wait to put the kettle on while I'm in there. Why Good not? thinking. Can I have a yeah, chocolate biscuit as well, Biscuit as, well, biscuits as anything. And <laughs> he says, doffing his cap as he leaves the room. <laughs> on a minute. Milk and wine. Oh, just, I'll shut this door. I'll shut the door. You want me to hear what I say to myself? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I negotiate my way across this uh, decidedly empty kitchen. I don't think he can hear us, but kitchen. mercifully we can and, hear him uh, mumbling in here. So. Right, young Heather, here's your sprouter. Yeah. Now, as I walked into the kitchen yeah. and negotiated my way across the various uh, yeah. bric-a-brac that's scattered on the kitchen floor, I looked inside yeah. and <clears throat> what, do you, what do you notice about those seeds? Um, they're sprouting. <laughs> they're sprouting, but no. they're, I think past tense. Some of them sprouted. Right. But yeah. what, what would you say that, that, they, uh, that they look like, especially the ones on the top? Um, are they a bit dry? Yeah. <laughs> no? <laughs> you see, they're almost like grains of sand drifting across the western, <laughs> western <laughs> desert. <laughs> So I think what's happened with some of these, they've sprouted, but they've started to, started to strip all because they're so dry. Oh. <laughs> but the, the bottom tiers are doing remarkably well. So you've got some different seed in here. What are these? This, is this, what sort of seed is this? A radish? Kind of a spicy, fiery one? Mm. You don't know, do you? <laughs> I can't remember which of which. No. Uh, OK, well, uh, those, are doing, uh, those are doing probably a little bit better, but they're still quite dry. And when did you water these last? Last night. Last night. Well, there's your mistake. Because I think you need to do these two or three times a day in this uh, terracotta pot. So I, but the thing is, though, Rich, this is great that you've told me this, yeah. but I watered the top... And the water fell out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the it trouble. It does, it does, yeah. It does, because well, they don't it? want to be immersed completely for any length of time. They just want to be saturated for that right. short period so they can take on sufficient moisture in order to encourage them to sprout. So, that, you know, all you get them really is that initial germination with these things and that's when you feast on them and with, with that intensity of flavour. Okay. But what you need to do is just make sure probably, you know, at least a couple of times a day, give them a good spraying with water and water drains down through these little perforations in the bottom of these trays into that bottom tray so of course you have to sort of empty that occasionally otherwise there might be a bit of uh, o- overflowing going on in the kitchen as well so. oh. <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not that I'm being completely dismissive over your efforts you know no. I, I don't want to uh, I, I, you know I don't want to appear rude by pointing out your inadequacies mm. at, at uh, <laughs> having yeah. said it consistently with watering but uh, that's what the, the crooks of the thing are that watering more frequently will pay dividends because <laughs> i noticed that you soaked them first didn't you 
Yeah, yeah, it said yeah, you've got to soak them for first. eight hours. Yeah, you've got to soak them first. I mean, it depends on the some some seeds like and soak them for twenty four hours and some like and that's eight. to break their dormancy, presumably. Yeah, it's just to thoroughly saturate them. Yeah, exactly that. And then of course you you let them drain, and because they're soaked, suddenly they think, oh great, you know, we're in a situation in a warm room that we can uh, we can germinate. And Why would you not use something like a sheet of blotting paper so that my experience of sprouting seeds would be for germination tests, and we tend to put them out on a piece of blotting paper, yeah. which would by its nature keep them down. You could do that. that. I mean, you do that. I mean, you do that with things like mustard and cress, anyway, don't you? Mm. You put them on something that sort of holds the water, and then they have, they they root then. And then, of course, with mustard and cress, you cut it, so you're not eating. So you're going to eat the so whole thing here. This is you eat the whole kit. Oh, I see. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. I so thought... is this like hydroponics then? Because they don't. It doesn't need any compost. No, hydroponics is the transportation of nutrient via a liquid to feed plants constantly. So their roots are established, but in a liquid medium rather than something like this that. that that has access to water temporarily, but purely to sustain it for a very short period. So what's the point of having that terracotta sprouter then, as opposed to jam jar? Well, you know, it's got lots of little intriguing features, this <laughs> sprouter, as Michael well knows. He's just been waxing lyrical about it. But, you know, interestingly, all the trays sit on top of one another, and they can sit on top of one another closely knit, simply by turning one of the trays. You can spray your seeds... All the water drains down to sump below, which so is, you can easily discard that water. Because it's uh, a terracotta, it has certain insulating properties, and consequently the seed is stressed a lot less and subject to fewer climatic influences than it might be in a, in a, in a jam jar. So you get a better rate of germination with the seed. So lots of little features, really, that you perhaps wouldn't notice as, a, as, a, as your average layman. But uh, you generally you buy is... this because it's very aesthetically pleasing. It yeah. looks pretty cool in the kitchen. Are you, are you so what I need to, to do is read the instructions suits. and water it. <laughs> then it'll be fine. Water, I just hear you watering. <laughs> to be honest, if you put everything in there and completely didn't do anything with it and just watered the seed, you know, you'd be nine tenths of the way there. I tell you what we'll do. We'll make one of our first videos of this year on how to set up the sprouter and what to do with it. Uh, what a good idea. Hey? Because yeah. we've got a whole series of videos coming up, uh, dear listener. Blogs. I've just got Nielsen's findings through to give us the top five sustainability topics for 2007. And they were global warming, renewable energy, resource conservation, reusing and recycling and carbon emissions. And the top blogs were Tree Hugger, which I really like. If you haven't been to Tree Hugger, give it a go. World Changing, Biopact, The Oil Drum and... The Alternative Consumer, which I also subscribe to. So you might like to try those out. We've got to go now because it's become so cold. The wind is hissing through the room. There's driving rain. And what we have to do is get on with today's work at Wiggly Wigglers. And today, we'd like to tell you, we'd like to share the news that we are through to the Mousy Finals. Hooray! Come on, team, come on! It's great, isn't it? What is it exactly? Mountain <laughs> trowel. <laughs> it's the online gardening equivalent to the Oscars, and it's run by In the Garden. Do you win anything substantial? Nothing at all. It's the like accolade. It's the accolade of it? winning. Right. And so if you could no, possibly... No food. <laughs> no food, no champers. <laughs> oh, leave accolade. it. <laughs> leave it. <laughs> I mean, we are through to, also through to, I suppose, which is a bigger award, which is the Observer and Guardian Ethical Award. Right. And we also happen to be chosen by the Chamber to be in their finals of their awards. But the important thing to say is... If you could possibly go to inthegardenonline.com if you enjoy this podcast and vote for us, we would be pleased, very, very pleased, because we love doing our podcast and it's great if other people spread the word that perhaps it's any good. If you don't want to vote for us, let me just find you the other people that you can vote for. It's bound to be the Alternative Kitchen garden i think i'd just like to add that if you don't wish to vote for us ricardo would really like to know why <laughs> what are you trying to say you're going to send me round oh, I, don't think, yeah. I don't think that's going to help well no all. you're the weakest link in the podcast therefore their <laughs> wish not to vote for us must be down to you oh, i see right that... i'm the weakest link and on what, on what basis do you come up with that conclusion? well that's what Anne told you you were and i wouldn't argue with oh her. very good and yeah, it's now snowing I think. it's so snowing the three finalists in the best gardening podcast are emma 
that's Emma at the Alternative Kitchen Garden. We've got Eric, who I've met uh, at Garden Fork TV. Uh-huh. Um, he's in New York. Right. And we've got Wiggly Wigglers. So uh, you know what you should do, dear listener. Go with your heart and your head. Go to www.mouseandtrowel.org and uh, please vote. Till next week. Bye. Bye bye. Bye for me. <laughs> I don't know, there's a whole world of editing there. I just, oh, you cut it all out. You're doing good. <laughs>